Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. It's Mark. You know, I've always wondered why, despite the fact that we've seen enormous progress in terms of technological knowledge, enormous progress in terms of chemical knowledge, paint is effectively the same thing now as it was, you know, 150 or maybe even 200 years ago. It's some sort of combination of resin, which is created from petroleum product combined with pigments, which are mined from the earth, which is basically just rock ground up to make suitable for the task. But as we've all seen over the last couple of years, whether it was the storms in the South three years ago now, it'll be three years ago in February, or the war in Ukraine, uh, petroleum products and products that get mined for, the pigments that we mine for, titanium and other products like that, it's becoming difficult to assure a constant source of supply. Paint is low on the priority list. And so when the oil refining facilities had to shut down and there was this supply problem, paint got a very low prioritization. We need gasoline, we need natural gas, we need oil, way more than we need paint. And so as those plants came back online, we were at the end of the line. And so we all saw the effects of that and the same thing from the war in Ukraine with the supply of pigment. And so I've always wondered, why has nobody thought to try to solve that problem? I'm sure that Sherwin Williams, I'm sure that Benjamin Moore, I'm sure that PPG, those combined are probably doing $40 billion a year in sales. I don't know how much they spend on research and development, but I suspect it's an enormous amount. And so why has nobody been able to solve that problem that to make a can of paint, we have to dig deeper into the earth, creating even a larger carbon footprint? And so those are some of the questions that I've actually always wondered about, and particularly that's been the case recently as we've been dealing with these raw material shortages. And so I actually reached out to an old friend of mine who's joining me on the episode, John Minerovich. John is a chemist with a really terrific pedigree in the industry. I'll let him share with you the specifics. And I ask him some of those questions. Why are we so addicted to earthen pigment? Why is the coatings industry so addicted to only getting uh, their resins from the deepest part of the planet? And so if you're at all curious about those things as I am, uh, give a listen. I think you'll enjoy this episode. So if that's interesting to you, I think you'll enjoy this episode. So give a listen. My friend, John Minerovich, Mini, uh, I've known him over 30 years. And if you're thinking about clicking off now because you think this is a bad idea for an episode, Brian, put my cell number up there. Shoot me a text. Let me know what you want to see me record videos about because I want to put up here what you guys are looking for. So thanks very much and enjoy my conversation with John Minerovich. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. With me today on my podcast is John Minerovich. John is a former chemist in the coatings industry. Minnie, how are you today? I'm doing quite well, uh, Mark. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for making the time. I appreciate it. Uh, John, uh, you and I are old friends, but for other people listening you know, who don't know your history, why don't you just give us a quick summary on your career history in the coatings industry? Sure, Mark. I'd be glad to. Uh, I've been in the coating industry for about 43 years. I just want to run through some of the companies I've been with. I, I spent a year at Norton & Sons in Bayonne. Uh, the, oh, I remember the, that. That, that became Muralo. Yep, that became Muralo. Yep. From there, I went to a, a small uh, company called Atlas Paint and Varnish in Irvington. They did a lot of government mill spec paints. Uh, from there, I went to International Paint, where I learned to formulate heavy-duty protective coatings for, for marine application as well as yacht coatings. And then from there, I went to Benjamin Moore, and I was with Benjamin Moore for 36 years, where I held a, a number of different positions. I worked in, in, initially in, in the interior solvent lab. I got involved with competitive testing, very much involved with the uh, paint test farm that used to be out on uh, Route 22 in Lebanon, which is now in uh, Flanders. Uh, I was the technical manager for industrial coatings on it. And that's how you and I met. I'm thinking from uh, the description you just gave somewhere in like the maybe uh, early to mid 90s, uh, Benjamin Moore introduced their industrial program. And, and at Tremont, we got heavily into it. I was fairly new in the business. I'd become NACE certified and I was really into uh, industrial coatings. And you and I started meeting on jobs and stuff because these coatings did have you know, sort of um, more difficult properties to work with and, and required a greater understanding than I had. And you were the one who Benjamin Moore sent to bail me out of those problems. <laughs> well, it's kind of you to say that. Uh so the reason you're here, you're obviously uh, a paint chemistry geek. 
And, and I've had some questions, you know, over the course of my life, some of them you and I have discussed over lunch, but we've never had a, a microphone and a video recording us. Some of them, you know, are just things that have been on my mind. And so I thought, well, let's go through some of them and let's find out why we're trapped uh, in the same paint can effectively that that we've been using for the last 50 years. And so if it's all right with you, let's let's get going. We got some questions prepared. Sure. Let's take a stab at it, Mark. And so for starters, you know, particularly now where so much focus uh, is on the cost of transportation and, and of transportation as part of the supply chain, why can't paint be just add water? Why are we shipping so much water around the United States? That's that's a very good question. Uh, well, a couple a couple reasons that I that I came up with. I'm sure there's there's probably others out there. Uh, my number one question would be: so so somebody gets this um, container of dry powder. You know how how would they mix it? Uh, should they just use a regular paint stir that they get from a paint store? That's really not going to be uh, enough to break down uh, the pigments and the and the and the, wob, and the and the globs of pigment into a uniform mixture. Uh, what you really need is something like a jiffy paddle uh, that you that you would be able to you know slowly pour the liquid into the into the powder and create a nice uniform mix. That would probably be the the, the ideal way of making it. There's a couple other things that that need to be addressed. I like the idea of being able to just add a liquid to a, to a dry powder, you know, like you said, for saving transportation costs, but, but you have to, you know, go back and think about what's, what's actually in the powder portion that you're, that you're uh, adding the liquid to. And of course, it's going to be pigments and extenders. There needs to be some kind of additives for, uh, for flow and leveling, for thickening, uh, mildecides. Uh, some of these are powders, some of these are not. You know, coalescing agents, uh, that's going to depend on what type of resin system that you uh, select. And probably the most important one is, is, is the resin or the binder, uh, because the resin binder is really the key to, uh, any, to, to adhesion to any substrate. And it really helps with durability. Pigments do help, but the resin is what really gives the, protects the uh, substrate from, from breaking down. But most of these dry resins, uh, the main drawback they have is durability, especially on exterior. You're not going to get a lot of, you know, long lasting, uh, you know, effects from, uh, fr from these dry resins. And so maybe the answer is not in dry goods. Maybe the answer is in some sort of paste, uh, you know, where a consumer can buy a tube of toothpaste that gets mixed with just water. But it seems to me, the part that I always struggle to get past is the water is the part that's consistent, right? And so why can't we just turn the tap on? And so even if we've made the can not a gallon, even if the can is, you know, a quarter of a gallon, and it gets three quarters of a gallon of water, we've still saved a tremendous amount of transportation. Right, because I think right now, currently, uh, I, I would think latex paint formulas are anywhere between 50 and 60 percent water or liquid the typical volume solids for a, a quality latex paint is probably around the 40 45 percent range for semi-gloss and, and and eggshells uh once you go flatter uh your mats and your flat finishes uh you're going to have more pigments so you're going to have less less water so sort of 50 percent is sort of your capacity right you couldn't get the can much smaller than 50 percent of what it is now is what you're saying even if you that would that would be yeah in, in my opinion yeah that, that would be right mark yeah but 50 percent a uh, gallon of water weighs a little about 8.3 pounds so that's about four pounds per gallon that you could still stop uh uh shipping and that of course would make it not just easier for paint manufacturers, that would make it easier for the paint stores. It might add a little burden to professional painters or the paint consumer because they'd have to start mixing it with water. But but the but the value is there. Further up the supply chain, I think would be significant. It would be, I think. Well, let's move on. I've I've always wondered that. I I'm I'm of the opinion that that that's coming. So I I just can't believe that that's not uh, coming in our future. For coatings, whether or not it sounds like what you and I have just been talking about here or not, well, the you know the future will tell. But I can't believe that that's not coming because the value just seems there. Anyway, let's move on because we had a couple of other topics that have been sure. on my mind. One of the things that I I almost always ask you when we're on the phone is why are paint manufacturers so addicted to resins that come from petrochemicals, even the water-based resins? 
uh, that we use in paints today, even uh, zero VOC resins, products that are sold as environmentally friendly. These are all coming. They're all byproducts of oil and the oil refining process. Why are we so addicted to that? Why are there no alternatives to that? They're, they're, most of the current raw materials are derived from petroleum or petroleum byproducts. Um, you know, primarily, like you said, primarily resins, uh, solvents, uh, co-solvents, uh, coalescing aids for water-based paints, and also freeze-thaw additives, you know, your, your, your glycol to prevent, uh, to keep paints from freezing. Uh, and also a lot of these petroleum derivatives uh, contribute to VOCs. That's another issue uh, that we've been trying to uh, minimize as we, as we formulate in the future. There are some natural resins that have been around for many, many years that I've been thinking about. And again, the, the key is gonna be durability. They're not very long lasting now, but perhaps down the road, somebody would develop something that would be more long lasting. Yes. Seed oil and casein come to mind, as you say, that those are both naturally occurring products that have both been used in coatings previously. Yeah, linseed oil is just derived, uh, you know, pressed flaxseed. Uh, it works very, very well with wood. Penetrates, uh, does does perform a nice, uh, nice protective layer. Linseed oil paints can be solvent free. Uh, you know, again, zero zero VOC. Uh, casein, uh, again, that's derived from from milk, uh, and that's been used for thousands of years. It's been used by the Egyptians in distemper paint uh, on walls and murals but again you're still uh, there five thousand years yes. later by the way so so don't go dissing casein right it obviously does the job but but, but again they're not very abrasion resistant i mean you can't, right. really, you can't rub against them or else you're losing your right right two thousand year old uh right. pictures uh and you know there's uh you know that that would be the stamper paint which is which is which is interesting there's a couple other ones that have been, have been considered as as resins for paints that would be beeswax which is interesting because that was used by the ancient greeks uh as as a binder for uh to make encaustic paints which were used again for paintings and it was used for ship bottoms uh to, to protect the uh the hulls of ships and so that obviously was abrasion resistant. Oh, it, it was definitely water resistant. Or right, at the very <laughs> least that, right, exactly. And another another binder uh, that maybe has some potential. Uh, there's a company in Germany doing some work with uh, these type of resins. Uh, starch, uh, which which comes from flour, and you can almost make an edible paint out of starch because it's uh, you know because it is it's very safe. Corn starch. For you know, for instance, you mix cornstarch, glycerin, and, and food coloring together, and uh, you can come up with some some sort of a, a paint. Uh, may, maybe not very long lasting, but it would but it would be decorative. It would be able to be brushable, depending on how you uh, blend the materials together. And as I said, there is a company in, in Germany that's experimenting with potato starch. Uh, I guess it's better than you know better than making vodka. Right. And, uh, <laughs> Nothing's better than making vodka, many. <laughs> but again, that's 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 a, that's an angle that somebody or or, or something that's uh, that that a company in Germany is is looking at that would be again very environmentally friendly, and it would be uh, quite recyclable and quite safe, environmentally safe. And and what do you think about the future of these? Do you think these sort of coatings are coming, or do you think that we're never going to be able to uh, break that attachment to the petrochemical industry? I think we're going to start weaning our way away from it as best we can. Uh, these these type of resin systems th th they do work for a limited period of time. You know, linseed oil unfortunately does yellow, so that's the that's the negative issue uh, with, with linseed oil. But is is there something out there that could be modified? Very possible. I mean, there's there's all sorts of uh, plant based materials that are being evaluated and looked at by companies. I think. You know, going down the going down the road, you will be seeing uh, some companies over there developing maybe not long lasting coatings, but maybe maybe coatings that are temporary. Uh, yeah. Maybe instead of lasting five to ten years, maybe they last two years. Right, but they're much safer for the environment. And by the way, two years would be a heck of a lot better for paint stores. Yep. <laughs> you think down the road you might see something like that. Uh, there, there's a lot of smart people that that, that are working in uh, you know the, the, the paint formulating labs. Uh, give them some 
some freedom to investigate new technologies and they they could they could you know easily put not easily but with with some work put together some some interesting new technology that may or may not work i think that this is coming there's somebody out there if it's not dan Hawkins, if it's not john maricus if it's not if it's not one of these guys it's it's somebody else who's recognizing that there's an opportunity here uh, and and I'm going to be able to push myself ahead with a big advancement in technology. And I think that one of these uh, CEOs, I'm I'm hoping, is making a significant investment in this area. Well, hopefully, if somebody, uh, one of those guys, happens to listen to part of your, part of your podcast, maybe that maybe this will, you know, nudge them in the right direction. At least get them thinking more about you know ha- how to get away from the oil industry, how 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 to how to develop a plant based renewable coding system. Dealers listening has Dan Calkins or John Maricus's email address. Let's go ahead and send them this episode. <laughs> and and so I have the same question for you, not so much on resins, but about pigments. We still do the same thing for pigments, which is to say that we, you know, we dig out of the earth and we process them in such a way that we can use them in pigments. But it's obviously wildly destructive. TiO2 uh, factory or or, uh, or mine is wildly destructive on the areas that it's in. Why are we so addicted to earthen pigments as well? Probably the, the main reason that I can see for, uh, for 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 mine pigments, well, you know, they're easy to get to. You, can, you dig them up, you grind them, uh, you, you separate them by particle size, and you know, you can control the particle size, and uh, that that will help develop some of the properties. Uh, but as far as titanium goes, that's a, that's a tough pigment to get an, a, pro, a replacement pigment for that because it actually has the highest refractive index of any pigment that's being used today. And just to just to go a little geek on you here, uh, refractive index is directly related to the hiding power of a paint or a coating. Uh, the opacity or hiding. Of a, of a paint is actually the physical effect of light rays bending and scattering within a paint film at the interfaces between the pigment and resin. So the more light is bent, the less likely there will be passage of the light through the paint, through the sub, uh, down to the substrate, which would give you a greater opa- a greater opacity uh, or hiding. So that's coverage. What you're talking about there is coverage. Right. And probably the one thing, uh, the, the most important thing to summarize this would be that light is bent to the greatest extent when there is a large refractive index difference between the pigment and the binder or pigment and the resin. You know, all resins, all pigments, they have different, you know, RIs, refractive indexes. Uh, Typically for binders, in general, they're anywhere between 1.45 to 1.6. Water itself has got a refractive index of 1.55. for reference, air is 1.0. Uh, when you start talking about pigments, uh, titanium, uh, there's two types of titanium. Uh, I'm sure most people right. are aware. There's, you know, rutile and there's rutile. anatase. Right. Uh, anatase is the, is the chalking type. Rutile is the uh, more durable type. Uh, refractive index for rutile is 2.76. For anatase is 2.55. You know, a little bit of difference there, not much. Um, then, you, then the next... Next closest pigment to either of the uh, titaniums is zinc oxide, which is 2.0. You know, from there, it's it, it goes down into the uh, it goes down significantly. You know, barium sulfate varieties 1.6, talc 1.59, uh, calcium carbonate. You know, used in a lot of whitewash paints 1.56, and all of these still need to be dug out of the earth. So these are. Yep not replacements for titanium. They're they're just an expensive or difficult to use alternative. Sounds like what you're saying is there really are no alternative to earthen pigments and that that's why we're still uh, using them the way that we do. That's that that's 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 my understanding. That's the way I've been formulating since you know since day one when I started my first job in in, in coatings. Well, Minnie, I enjoyed this conversation. This was really exactly what what I was hoping for. I think that there are some real questions to the technology of paint that I've always wondered. And I hope that dealers listening and other people that are just curious about paint itself uh, found some of the solutions to that here. And I really appreciate you making the time. Thanks again, Mark, for asking me. Uh, I enjoyed it. Maybe our conversation will create some interest in some of the topics we talked about, hopefully for the better of the industry. 